I'm going to, this lecture is actually going to be a prequel to John's lecture. I'm going to talk about how we came, why we introduced these, this refinement of, um, of Stanley's chromatic symmetric function. So it all started with Eulerian polynomials. So this is a prequel. The Eulerian, did I spell, no, I spelled prequel wrong. The Eulerian polynomials. So a n of t is, can be defined this way. or it could be defined this way. And so let recall, that the descent of a permutation, the descent number of a permutation is the number of I in n minus one, one through n minus one, where sigma i is bigger than sigma i plus one. Okay, I don't have room for that vertical bar. Okay, the exceedance number is the number of i such that sigma i is bigger than i. So either of these statistics can be used to define the Eulerian numbers. Let me just recall a few other statistics, the descent set is that set that the descent number is counted. That's an equal sign. And that enables us to define the major index of a permutation. And that's the sum of the elements in the descent set. And then an equidistributed major index is equidistributed did with the inversion statistic, which counts the pairs i and j, such that sigma i is greater than sigma j, while i is bigger than j. Okay, and these two statistics are known as Euler Eulerian statistics because they define the Eulerian polynomials. And these two are the Mahonian statistics. Mahonian. Well, I won't write it out. Those are the Mahonian statistics because they, uh, they are equally distributed and they, uh, and they give the uh, Q analog of the factorial of the event factorial. Um, Michelle? Yes. Um, may I ask, um, so do you, did you want to say I less than J instead of I bigger than J for you? Oh yes, questions? I did, thank you. Thanks, right. Okay, so uh, for example, here's some examples of the Eulerian polynomials. 
A3. One plus four T plus T squared, A4. I'm not gonna work it out. I'm sure everyone has seen this or most people have. So those are two examples. And properties of the Eulerian polynomials that are relevant here are they are calendromic. So that is, if you read the um, entries, the coefficients from left to right, it reads the same as if you read from right to left. And they are unimodal. They increase to the middle, and then they decrease. And this symbol, like the binomial coefficient, only square, we can use that for the coefficients. Those are the Eulerian numbers, the coefficients of the Eulerian polynomials, n, j. So they're palindromic. and unimodal. Up to the middle. And then it goes back down. Oops. Oh, that's right. Okay, so John and I studied a Q analog. This is in a paper that I'm talking about in, I think about 2006 or something like that. So a Q analog. And this Q analog involves the major index and the exceedance index. Other Q analogs had been studied before. In particular, Richard Stanley had a, had a formula for that involved the, uh, the inversion statistic and the descent statistic. Uh, he, had a, he obtained a Q analog of Euler's exponential generating function formula. So here's our Q analog. I could have just written this without that without subtracting this off. Everything I say it would is the same. It would just be replacing the the T by QT to get the, um, without it, to leave this out. Just replace the, the T by QT. So this is the Q analog and examples are A3, and so you could see that the coefficient of T when Q is set equal to one, you get four, one plus four T plus T squared. And here's a four. And that's one plus three plus two Q plus three Q squared plus two Q plus Q four. And when Q is one, that's just an 11. Um, Michelle, 
So yes. Maria asked a question um, in the chat. She asked if that is a combinatorial proof of like, um, so you mentioned that it's unimodal um, in the, yes. right? So is there any um, combinatorial proof of that? Of, of back here? Yeah. The ordinary or Larian. Y yeah. Yes. There are, uh, there are all different kinds of proofs. One involves, oh, they're all different. One involves gamma positivity, can be used to prove it. Um, there's, it's real rooted, so that, but that's not the combinatorial proof, but gamma positivity type of proof would be combinatorial. And I'll mention another way of proving it in a minute. So, um, so John and I proved the following theorem. I guess it was 2007. Okay, where um, the Q analog of N of N is one plus Q plus Q to the N minus one, which is the same as Q to the N minus one over Q to the one over Q minus one, and then the So that's the Q analog of N factorial and X Q is the sum um, U to the N over the Q analog of N factorial. So the, this is a Q analog of Euler's exponential generating function formula. And I was saying before that Richard Stanley also has a Q analog. It looks similar to this, but he's working with uh, inversion index and, and descent, number of inversions and descent number. Okay. Michelle? Yes. <clears throat> uh, you mentioned unimodality, but uh, actually, right. Uh, the Eulerian have a stronger condition property yeah. of log yeah. concavity. Yes, and gamma positive, both right. And they're real rooted, so that gives that all that implies everything, all of it. Yeah. So, yes. So, um, so first thing I want to note about this formula, what I just said. Q equals one, this immediately re reduces to Euler's exponential generating function formula. And um, two, it follows from the formula. I won't go into how, but it's not difficult to obtain from the formula that a n Qt is palindromic. And it also is unimodal in the following sense. Q unimodal, I'm calling it. Um, so let me. Let's look at this example. So by Q unimodal, I mean that when you take a coefficient before the middle, like a coefficient of T before the middle, that this polynomial minus the polynomial before is 
has positive coefficients. It's a polynomial in Q with positive coefficients. So this minus this certainly has positive coefficients. The example's not big enough, but it increases. By increases, I mean the difference is a polynomial in Q with positive coefficients. And you can see the palindromicity here too. This equals this. So it's from this formula that you can derive those two properties. And so that's what I was gonna say a few minutes ago from Euler's original exponential generating function, you can get palindromicity and unimodality of the coefficients for the original Q equals one case. Okay. So this, theor this formula here, we, can, we were working on a problem in post-set topology and we conjectured that this formula would be true. And it took us a while to prove it though. So this is how we proved it. We, um, we lifted it to a symmetric function identity. So here's what, what we did. We, uh, Q and X T. Yeah. I'll say what this is in a minute, but this is going to be the symmetric analog of the Eulerian polynomials. That's what that Q and X T is. And on the right side, we have that one minus T again. And instead of X, we have H of U. And here we have H of TU minus TH of U. And when we specialize, P, we take the stable principle specialization on the left, we get, that's a symmetric function. On the left, we get ANQT, So that's our Q exponential generating function when we specialize. And on the right, we get one minus T. So we get our Q, um, a formula for the, for the exponential generating function, the Q exponential generating function when we specialize. So our approach to proving this formula was to study this one, try to prove that one. So let me say what everything is where H of U is the sum. And this is the complete, Hn is the complete homogeneous symmetric functions. Okay. And Q, Xt, I will say what that is in a minute. PS of a symmetric function or even a quasi-symmetric function. This is a variant of stable principle specialization. And that's gonna be PS of F is F of one Q. We're replacing X one by one, X two by Q. And then we're multiplying by one minus Q to the N. So it's just this, that's the extra piece that's not normally included in principle specialization, but just more convenient for the talk to include it. So stable principle specialization is what we apply to this formula here. 
in order to get to this formula in order to get that. Um, Michelle, yes. um, in the principal specialization on the left, um, yes. so we are, I think there are several people talking in the chat. Is there something like a power that's missing in the A and Q T? A and Q T, yes, thank you. U to the N. Oops. Yes. Thank you. Okay. And this, and of course, for this to make sense, F is homogeneous of degree N. Otherwise. Okay. So I'm gonna, I still have to tell you what QXT is. And so in order to do that, let me just review Gessel's fundamental quasi-symmetric function. So for S, subset of the set. F, S, and I'll often leave off the N um, when it's understood, is the sum. Most people go down, go up with these indices. I'm going down, it's the same thing. Well, it's, it actually becomes a little different, but it's equivalent, I should say. So the indices are decreasing and a strict, strict decrease when um, there's an element of the set. So they were closely related to the Gessel's original definition. And it, they form a basis for the ring of quasi-symmetric functions. And when you take PS, the version where this variant PS of this uh, fundamental quasi-symmetric function, you get Q to the sum of the elements of the set over the Q analog of N factorial. So, when you have, this is just by the symbol I'm using for S belongs to S, S. So for example, HN, the set is the empty set. And EN, the set is the maximum set you could have. So the elementary symmetric functions and the complete homogeneous symmetric functions, they are, they are examples of these fundamental. And when you take PS, HN, you get UN for N factorial. Okay, so that's why the right hand side specialized the way it did. Okay, and so now what about the Q, Q, and XT? That we defined our definition, our definition was sum F dex. Of 
Okay, now dex I'm not gonna I'm not gonna define, but it's a it's a it set statistic like DES, the descent set. So this is the DEX set. And this is uh this was our definition of QN. XT. So I'm not giving the original definition because I, I'm not going to say what DEX is. Um, but the property that DEX had that's relevant, when we sum the elements of DEX, we get MAG minus X. Oops. And so that's why PS of QN is was equal to um, which was precisely a n q t. So from our original definition, we were able to uh, specialize easily to get the q Eulerian polynomials from this definition. And we call this an Eulerian quasi-symmetric function. Even though it's symmetric, but since it was defined in this quasi-symmetric way, it, it we called it. And it, to see that it's symmetric, there are various ways to see that's symmetric, but one way to see it is from the formula that we end up proving um, for the generating function of these QMTs. So this formula, we can see that it's symmetric from this formula that we end up proving. I'm, right, I'm rewriting the formula. Um, Michelle, so yes. I think um, there are some audience asking if in the definition of QN, is there like a missing T power as well? Um, Probably, let me see. Uh, yes, T to the X. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everybody, for the corrections. I won't have to do much to check this over. Let me get rid of this. Okay, thanks for the corrections. So that's the polynomial. Yeah, Michelle. Yes. <laughs> uh, in this queue, uh, you have AX uh, exceedance, I think. And is there yeah. uh, another statistics which is equidistributed that replaces EX? With DES? Yes, there is. And I'll, I'll be talking about that. The, uh, a partner, so you want a partner for DES that corresponds to MAG minus X. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I will talk about what that is. We do have that. Okay. So, um, okay, so we know, so this is a symmetric function. Um, to prove this formula, to prove this, we used two alternative definitions. 
characterizations. Character. I think I misspelled that characterizations. Okay, so one we called ornaments, but the one that I um, want to talk about now, it was we is called banner characterization. So let me say what a banner is. We is a word over the barred alphabet. One, one bar, two, two bar, and so forth. Such that one, each unbarred letter is followed by a letter greater than or equal in value or is last. Each barred letter is followed by a letter less than or equal in value. Oh no, there's no words left. Okay. So those are the conditions. So for example, and this just came up in our trying to prove the theorem, we defined this class of words. So two, three, eight bar, three, three, five bar, five bar, four bar, four, six. Okay, so let's check the condition. If it's unbarred like that, it has to be followed by a greater than or equal letter. So this could have been a two. Three is unbarred, has to be followed by something in value. And by in value, I mean where you ignore the bar. So three is followed by uh, something bigger. Eight is barred, it has to be followed by something smaller. Three, something bigger than or equal to three, and so forth. So uh, that's what a, a banner is. And so we, we prove that QN XT can be characterized this way. So we, we um, where XB is the usual, well, actually it's not the usual, XB is obtained by, um, let me write, a, do an example. XB here would be X2, X3, X8. So we're ignoring the bar now. X3, X3, X5, X5, X4, X4, X6. So that's what I mean by X sub V. Oops. Okay, so we just write the in the usual way except ignoring the bars. And so we use this this characterization to obtain a recurrence relation. for QN. And that leads to the generating function.
I don't want to, this got a little complicated, so I'm not going to try to describe the recurrence relation, but that's what, that's how we use this to prove the generating function formula. Okay, so after we did this work, uh, Richard Stanley uh, emailed us and noticed that our banners, these banners that we discussed, defined here could be described as p partitions so i want to and this was a very important observation it turns out that that richard made um, so let me um, describe how a banner is a p partition p partition given a finite poset P, a function P, F from P to the positive integers is a P partition if it is weakly decreasing. In other words, f of a is bigger than or equal to f of b if a is bigger than b in p. Okay, so that's a p partition. It generalizes and, um, well, it, I, it, no, let's, I don't want to get into that. It, that's just, there's a more general definition of P partition, but this special, this is a one form of a P partition. Um, F is a strict P partition if it is strictly decreasing. And that's f of a is strictly greater than f of b if a is greater than b in p. Oh, I got this backwards again. The same mistake I made before. That should be the other way around. Somebody probably already put it in the chat. Okay. So that's a strict P partition. And then we can let F P be the set of P partitions and F P tilde be the set of strict P partitions. And then we define KP of X XF the usual way and K tilde X. This is a tilde. That's not a tilde. X F. Okay, so these are two um, quasi symmetric functions. I should just say like this. Where N is the size of P. Okay. So, um, 
So here's one of Stanley's results. I think going back to the 70s. And it says for all posets P of size N, Omega KP of X is equal to K tilde P of X. When you apply the involution Omega, the involution Omega for the, for the quasi-symmetric functions, that just takes Q sim. takes FSN to F and minus one minus S. And so this is when you um, look at the subset of symmetric functions, this is just the usual involution on the symmetric functions because it's taking when S is the empty set, it's taking the homogeneous to the elementary. So it's the usual involution. So uh, that's P partition reciprocity. So Stanley's observation is that is the following. Let P be a zigzag poset So in other words, what do I mean by zigzag poset? It just this is the Hasse diagram. It goes it's maybe it has a better name than this, but it looks like that. It goes up and down or down and up and down so any number of steps, up any number of steps. So this is the Hasse diagram of the post set. And let's put a P partition. So this is P and P part. If we want a P partition, that means we want a weekly decreasing um, function. So here's one, uh, two, three, eight. Get rid of Two, three, eight, three, two, let me, now I have to do it all for you. Sorry. Michelle, next time you can just undo. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Two, three, eight, three, three, five, five, four, four, six. Okay, so that should be weekly decreasing. As you go up in the post set, the numbers should weekly decrease. And so I think that's clear that they do. If you can read my handwriting, it's clear. Oh, I think I'm missing something here. Four. Okay, and that's a three. And so this belongs to F, P. Okay, this corresponds to a banner. You just write the word, read those uh, uh, labels from left, those uh, values of the function from left to right, three, five, five, four, 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 six. Okay, that's, that's not the banner we want because we won't be able to go backwards with such a banner. When we come to this three, three, we won't know if we're going up or down in the, in the poset. Well, because it could be a different poset. Let me, um, I'm not being clear here, but they could be, a, this could be the banner for a different, uh, zigzag post set. 
So to keep track of exactly which post set we're talking about, we will put a bar on top of the letters where the next step is an up step. So I put a bar there. And then whenever the next step's an up step, we put a bar. So there's a bar there, there's an up step after the five, an up step, an up step, the last four, there's a down step. So the up steps get the bars. And this is a banner. That's B10. That belongs to the set of banners B10. Okay, and we can go back and forth. Any banner will correspond to a P partition on a zigzag post set. And the bars are telling us what the post set is. And now let's look at this zigzag post set again. And this time I'm going to do a, um, a strict P partition. So this is going to belong to FP tilde, a strict P partition. So that means I won't be allowed to have anything like this, two threes in a row. So that's, let's do two, three, oops, two, three, eight, three, four, five, four, two, one, six. I don't want this extra. Same zigzag post set. Okay, and that's strict now. And that corresponds, if we read the words from left to right, to the word two, three, eight, three, four, five, four, two, one, six. Just that's very simple. There are no bars. We just read the words from left to right. So what kind of words are we going to get when we do that? Well, we're going to get every possible word if we allow ourselves to use any zigzag post set. We're going to get words in which adjacent letters are different. That's the only, and that's called a Smirnoff word. adjacent letters. So it's only from the descents that we're going to know what the zigzag post set is. There's a descent at A3. That means the zigzag post set must have gone up at that point. There's a descent three, four, four, here. So again, the zigzag post set went up here. So every descent corresponds to an up step of the zigzag post set. Up steps. So even we might not know what this exact post set is if we're just given a Smirnoff word. Then we look at the descents, and that's going to tell us exactly what the zigzag post set is. So for every Smirnoff word, there's a unique zigzag post set with a uh, with a uh, with the uh, P partition corresponding to that Smirnoff word. So we have, uh, so let SWN be the set of Smirnoff words. On Z 
and the positive integers. Um, and we have of 110. And we have B, we have, from what I've been saying, we have first the banners, I'll use this ZZ for zigzag word of 110. Here are the K partition, the P partitions. P to the up steps. And here's W is a Smirnoff word. T to the number of descents of the word, because the sense correspond to the up steps again. So this is Stanley's observation that when you sum over the banners, um, you get the sum over the P partitions according to those up steps. And what, and by P partition, and then if you do the same, if you do this for strict P partitions, you end up with these Smirnoff words. And then by P partition reciprocity. We have that uh, omega applied to QN XT is equal to omega bars. So omega, this is just the, the characterization of QNXT, and this is equal to and this is what we will call the Smirnoff word enumerator. So this is equal to this is the definition of the Smirnoff word enumerator. So when we apply omega to our quasi-symmetric function, Eulerian quasi-symmetric function, we get the Smirnoff word enumerator by P partition reciprocity. And so our result, our generating function result becomes Instead of E elementary, we have, I mean, instead of the homogeneous, we have the elementary. So this is the Smirnoff word enumerator. And so that's what Stanley observed, that our result is equivalent to this result. Uh, was I supposed to finish at 10 or? No, it does no, like, I mean, like as long as we finish by one, you're fine. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I'm, <laughs> but fine. I'm on West Coast. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. So I am supposed to finish at one, so including no, questions. No, you're fine, no, 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 no. We can oh, okay. overrun, it's fine. Okay, so this is the generating function result that's equivalent to our result. 
And um, Michelle? And, yes. Uh, now that you have uh, this uh, correspondence between P partitions and your initial definition of Q, uh, mm -hmm. then the P partitions give you more uh, choices for partitions. So is there a generalized uh, discussion on uh, defining an extended Q definition based on a wider class of partitions? Instead of zigzag. Yeah. Um, I have to think about that more. We are going to look at, yeah. I have to, that sounds interesting. I'd have to think, yeah. So I don't know what to say now, but it sounds interesting. Um, okay. So Smirnoff words, let me just say, are the same as proper colorings. of path graphs. So here's the path graph with n nodes. There are n nodes in the path graphs. And if we label or color the nodes with the letters of the Smirnoff word, So a proper coloring of the path graph is a Smyrna Ford because the condition is that adjacent letters have to be different. So this is just the proper coloring. So that's how we ended up at graph colorings because a Smyrna Ford is a graph coloring. And um, so S, W, X1 is the chromatic symmetric function. of the path. And we are looking at a refinement of that. We were looking at the label path graph to uh, define what SW and XT is. Path graph. So this was is equal to, we take all the proper colorings. I think John used the notation ca uh, kappa or I'm using C of PN. The colorings of the path graph and we are looking at the dis number of descents in the coloring and then X, C. And the number of descents is just counting the edges where there's um, with a color decreases. So we're looking at the edges and if the color decreases, we're calling it a descent. That's exactly how the Smyrna Ford numerator was defined. So this brings us to the refinement of the chromatic symmetric function for the path. And the next thing was to say, well, can't we do this for general graphs? And since I'm out of time, next time I'll continue. We've, we've reached, this is how we reached the definition of a refinement of chromatic symmetric function. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. So any questions? Hi, Michelle. So Hi. very nice talk. Um, I just Thank you. Qu again, yeah. since we're talking about the history here. Um, I'm looking out oh, oh, there. Okay. It's Bruce. I'm looking for who's uh, yeah, Bruce, it's Bruce. Right. sorry about that. I should have said who it was. <laughs> yeah, but I'm looking. Oh, there you are. I was looking it's, for your. It's very confusing. Yeah. Yeah. 
Anyway, nice to see you. Um, Good to see you. so uh, this is just a question I, I've had. So in your actual paper with John, you define the quasi-symmetric chromatic uh, some, uh, chromatic quasi-symmetric function in terms of ascents rather than descents. Why did you switch? Was there a, a reason or just... Yeah, because you're saying here we have descents. Why did I do ascents? Exactly. I, I, something worked out easier with ascents. I don't remember. But once when it's symmetric, it doesn't matter. Yeah, so no, if, I, that, that was my question. If it doesn't matter, why not use descents, which is what we usually use. But you're saying there was some proof in there. Yeah, that and often when I give a talk, I just, often when I give a talk, I use descents. But in the paper, you're right, it's ascents. I think some formula worked out better. Probably the, I mean, it probably the decomposition into the fundamental quasi-symmetric functions work out better because then it's different. It, if it's not symmetric, then it matters. And so I think that one worked out e more easily. Exactly. So that's why we used that sense. Gotcha. So, okay, great. Thanks, thanks so much. That cleared up thanks. my curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Uh, any other questions? Any other questions? If not, then let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you. And I will see you all on Thursday, the same yeah, time. I just, and, and next time I'll talk about the chromatic quasi. -sy. So this was the, the prequel, and now we get back, we get into the chromatic quasi symmetric functions. Next. Time. Thank you so much. It's a very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you. See Bye. you all. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Michelle. <clears throat> Bye. Good to see everyone. Thank you, Michelle. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.